Betty, too. Um, tonight's speaker is Bruce Lauer and Renee Lauer. The history of the Lauer Foundation began decades ago. And by the way, I'm cheating on my introduction here. I'm borrowing somebody else's uh, writing. Um, Bruce began his lifelong interest in paleontology back in the 1970s, collecting fossil concretions around Mason Creek. As a member of the Esconi um, Club, his interest in collection of fossils grew to include scientifically important specimens. Bruce and Renee Lauer recognized that their con collection contained scientifically important specimens, and they sought to find a solution to provide permanent access to these specimens for science and to properly curate the, found the collection. Their collection provides a rare glimpse at the biota of two important fossil locations in Germany, which is the Jurassic Age, and Maison Creek in Illinois, which is the Carboniferous Age. And with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn the um, to, uh, floor over to Bruce and Renee. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. This was a, uh, a, a long project to try to put things together. And uh, I think as John and others and Andrew have said, you know, the, one of the best ways to learn more about something is to put together a presentation. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging my son, Bobby, who without him, you would not be looking at this PowerPoint that we finally got up on the screen. And it is also his birthday today. Yeah, and it is Bobby's birthday uh, today. Anyway, um, <clears throat> anyway, let, let's start out. Um, uh, I call this presentation a snapshot in time. It, it kind of is a throwback to an exhibition we did with Burpee. And, uh, you know, Solenhofen is one of the most iconic and famous fossil locations in the world, has a rich history and has produced Archaeopteryx, one of the most iconic fossils, which really helped link dinosaurs to birds. Um, <clears throat> oops, uh oh, it's going to let me. Oh, it's not going to let me turn the page. Oh, no. You can use your up and down arrow keys also. Yeah, your keyboard. it's not doing anything. Hmm. Great. So. What is this over here? No, it's just me talking. Um, hmm. May I'm have. Going to pause for a moment. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, on this slide, you can see the. Uh, uh, some of the things that are, are, are historic and interesting about Sonhofen. Um, on the left is the Berlin Archaeopteryx, uh, pretty iconic. People recognize that. But uh, in the middle and on the side are some historical drawings of the of the uh, Sonhofen quarries. And you can see these little huts that the, the quarrymen used to do. And what's really interesting about it is on the left-hand side, you see these slabs here, and these are slabs with fossils on it. And it suggests that um, that even at, at this time, the quarrymen would put these slabs out of fossils for sale. So the presentation is tended to uh, <clears throat> be an overview of the Solnhofen fossils and their deep history. Uh, we'll cover about, uh, how I got interested in Solnhofen a little bit more in detail. Um, and also, what is a Lagerstadt? Although I know John went over this in one of his speeches, we'll go over that again. Um, Solonhofen has a, a, a long history. And uh, we talk a little bit about geology, some of the notable scientists, um, and, and you can see the, re the rest of the things we're going to talk about. So I won't spend time on that. Um, so, how did I get interested in Solonhofen fossils? <clears throat> As um, as we heard earlier, I started collecting fossils when I was young and joined the Esconi Downers Grove Juniors Group. And at that point in time, it was headed by Bill Pop. Um, my father ended up being field trip chairman for Esconi for a number of years, and uh, we participated in many field trips. Um, obviously, at that time in the 70s, it was much easier to collect at different spots. So uh, you know, we clearly collected at Maison Creek, at Pit 11, Morris, Clam Flats. Um, 
the Detroit Mineral Show at the time was quite a big show. It doesn't exist anymore. It was much like the, the Denver show, but not quite as big as the Tucson show. So I was introduced to Solnhofen material by a, a Swiss dealer, and his name is Kirby Sieber. Now, Kirby is a uh, has a museum in Switzerland, uh, and so he he's he's been in the business a long time. Um, <clears throat> what I was attracted to was the preservation of the Solenhofen fossils, and uh, it, you know just such excellent preservation. Um, obviously, at this point in time, considering I was still in high school, I couldn't collect myself, so I saved my money to buy specimens, and Kirby at the time seemed to be the only one that had any Sonhofen fossils here available in the U.S. Uh, at this time, <clears throat> I was uh, displaying competitively um, back in the 70s, the Midwest Federation show and the American Federation show had a really extensive uh, competitive uh, uh, system for fossils, lapidary, all sorts of things. And um, this is a, a, a scorecard from the 1976 convention uh, that was in St. Louis. And it, at this particular one, I had been displaying for a number of years and I had wanted to show my Solenhofen material. And uh, so I, I uh, found a special category, uh, specialized fossils, and I was going to display arthropods from, from Solnhofen. And one of the judge's comments was, variety in your chosen phylum should, should uh, be greater, essentially. You know, the, they uh, were schooling me that, you know, there was 188 or 180 insects available and I only had one and uh you know no arachnids were displayed which was an interesting comment because there's hardly any in in that particular area so anyway that sort of incentivized me into trying to uh to uh expand the collection um just to note the foundation now has uh 406 vertebrate fossils 1,725 invertebrates and 118 plant fossils, all from the Solenhofen area. So I think we did uh, address the variety issue. Uh, what is a Lagerstadt? <clears throat> that was coined in 1970 by Adolf Seichler. Um, Lagerstadt comes from um, the German lager meaning storage and stadt meaning place. Um, the singular, you, you hear Lagerstadt and Lagerstadt and sort of interchangeably, the singular version is Lagerstadt and the plurals Lagerstadt. Um, there's two types of Lagerstadt, one the conservat uh, Lagerstadt, which is used when a location has exceptional preservation. So Solnhofen would be an example of that, as well as Maison Creek and Green River. Uh, a concentrate basically concentrate uh, in German Lagerstadt is used when the location has a, a high concentration of fossils, um, per, perhaps like a, zone, a bone bed, something like that, but doesn't necessarily require exceptional preservation. Lagerstätte. <laughs> so, um, why is Solenhofen famous? Uh, well, it has a lot of historical significant, uh, significance. Uh, many people recognize Solenhofen as a fossil locality in Germany. As we will see. Lagerstätte. I don't know what's that. She's mute. Oh, hang on. I think that might be something here. I don't know. Uh, That's going to be fun. Uh, okay. Many people, uh, as we will see, Solenhofen is simply one of many towns in the area. People know Solenhofen as the locality where Archaeopteryx was found. This was, a, you know, again, the link between dinosaurs and birds. Uh, in the past, people knew Solenhofen for the limestone that was quarried there. Um, and then early scientists and collectors were fascinated by the fossils that coming from these quarries, as we showed in that... Um, historical picture. Uh, not all Solenhofen fossils are from actually from Solenhofen. 
As you can see here, Solenhofen is on the uh, western edge of the Altmuhl uh, River Valley. And, um, and you can see that a lot of these quarries go all the way over here, almost to Regensburg. And, and so there's a lot of different quarries here. Eichstadt is right here. Uh, and uh, Morsheim is in here, and these are all very famous quarries. <clears throat> Archaeopteryx is one of the most iconic and important fossils, as we talked about. Um, this is really a, a list of all the different known specimens at this point in time. In fact, there's a, a couple more to be added. Um, uh, the first discovery was a single feather that was found in 1860 or 1861. It was described in 1861 by a gentleman named Harmon von Meyer. Uh, the first skeleton known uh, was the London specimen. Uh, and that was uh, found in 1861, described in 1863 by Richard Owen. Uh, Darwin used this specimen to boost his theory of evolution. Other than the feather, the unofficial names of the specimens follow the convention of where they are housed. For instance, the London specimen, the Berlin specimen, and so on. Officially, there's 12 specimens plus the feather. 11 of the 12 have feathers on them. Um, as we said, the feather was found in 1860, 1861. The London specimen was found in 1861 in, in, in Langenalfheim. The Berlin specimen was found in 1874 to 1875 in uh, the Blumenberg Quarry, which is near Eichstadt. The Maxburg specimen was found in 1956 near uh, in the quarry in Langenalfheim. Uh, interestingly enough, the Maxburg specimen was in a, a museum for the longest time and is currently missing. That museum closed and nobody's sure where that specimen went. Uh, the fifth one is the Harlem uh, specimen, which is in uh, uh, from Reidenberg that was found in 1855. This one is not Archaeopteryx. It's really been redescribed as Ostromia. So it's, a, it's really not Archaeopteryx. Um, the sixth specimen is the Eichstadt specimen. And you jump all the way to 1951 when that was found. And that was found in a quarry called Worker's Zell, uh, north of Eichstadt. The Solenhofen specimen was found in the 1970s in uh, Eichstadt, or yeah, in Eichstadt. The Munich specimen was found in 92, again in langen Alfheim. Uh, so that's three from that same quarry. Uh, there was a specimen found in a quarry in Dighting in 1990. It's just a partial specimen. Um, the Bergemeister Mueller Museum specimen was found in 2000. Uh, they, they call that the chicken wing uh, because it's just a wing that was found. And then you may have heard of the Thermopolis specimen, which spends a lot of its time in Thermopolis, Wyoming. Uh, that was found in 2005, and the location that where that's found has not been disclosed. And then there's two more, uh, number 12 and 13, uh, found in 2011 and 2010, one in, uh, location unknown and the other in Schamhopten uh, Quarry. Um, both are held in private collections in Germany. So one reason the scientists and collectors get access to fossil specimens is because there is a commercial reason to quarry the stone. And that's pretty typical of most fossil collecting. Uh, this is especially true for Solenhof and limestone. The fine grain limestone was used for many purposes and will be discussed a little bit later. Um, the limestone was mined for floor and wall tile. It was main, uh, mined for roofing tile, and most importantly at the time, it was mined for lithographic plates for printing. Uh, collectors and scientists were fascinated with fossils from the many quarries. Early collectors and scientists tended to be physicians. Many would have their own so-called cabinet of curiosities. 
So the collection of Solnhofen fossils has, has a very long history. And these are some of the very earliest collectors. Uh, Bacillus Bessler started in 1561 through 1629. He, he lived near Nuremberg, Germany and was a pharmacist. He was a publisher and a collector. His publisher was mainly on uh, copper plates for plant fossils. Um, Johann Jacob Baer was a physician in Nuremberg. He collected from 1677 to 1735. And then uh, Cosimo Alessandro Gallini, 1727 to 1806. He was part of the royal family in Italy and he described the so-called first flying dinosaur, which would have been a pterosaur. <clears throat> Again, this is a, a specimen that really shows the, the history of, of the location. This is a fish called Tharsis dubius. It's inscribed in the year 1543. Um, you'll see that the Catholic Church was heavily involved with fossils in this area, and this was a convenient uh, uh, proof of the deluge in the Bible. Um, the history of the Solnhofen area goes back a long time. The, the mining of, of, of the, uh, the limestone goes for, you know, for quite a while. This, and this was all tied very heavily to the Catholic Church. So to this day, the collection at the Ura Museum in Eichstadt is owned by the Catholic Church and helped and is managed by the Bavarian state as well. Our friend, uh, Dr. Helmut Tischler wrote a, um, a paper about the history of this area and the interconnection with the church and it was published in the journal Archaeopteryx, which is uh, the uh, scientific uh, uh, journal of the Euro Museum. It's in German, uh, but it is fascinating. <clears throat> Again, here's an example of, of a Solenhofen limestone. On the right-hand side, um, very elaborate calendars were produced by the Catholic Church every year. And they were carved in the um, in the limestone, and so this would have been obviously for the the wealthy uh, church members. But what's interesting about this is if you look at this bottom section here, this is a, a blow up of that. These cherubs here are holding plates, and on those plates are fossils from the Solenhofen area. The town of Eichstadt, um, it was the home of the bishop's residence, and it and to this day it has a seminary a seminary there. And in fact, this building, that red roof there, is the seminary. And you'll find in the in the town uh, this this beautiful fountain that's uh, right right by the seminary. And that once again, here's the cherubs, and here you see the fossil fish. I think this was some sort of lobster. But again, showing the significance of what the fossils uh, were at the time um, to the area. So where is Solenhofen? Uh, it's, most people probably understand where it is. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, again, in Europe and Southern Germany in the Bavaria region. So this is a, a blow up of Southern Germany and the Altmill River Valley where all these quarries are lies just about in here between Munich and, and, uh, and uh, Nuremberg. So once again, we saw this map on the right before of all the different quarries. And um, again, here's Eichstadt, here's Solenhofen, and in some uh, Kelheim over here is where a lot of the, the quarries end up stopping on, on this side. This map, shows uh, at the in during the Jurassic, um, the basins and kind of the reef area where these lagoons would be. So this again was a uh, an archipelago and there would have been, you know, land masses up in this region and down in this region, but this would have been the Tethys Ocean. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that 
later. Um, as I mentioned, the Altmo River runs through the area. This on the left is the Altmo River. And on the right, um, put this in for John's benefit. It is an ammonite with an archaeotrix <laughs> found inside of it. Um, but this is an area that uh, <clears throat> is uh, basically a nature park, provides cycling, rafting, and hiking opportunities um, uh, for the, the general public. We have canoed down this, although our canoe adventure ended up being us in the water and the canoe going on its very own way. So that was not what we intended. Um, next, we'll take a look at the history of the Solenhofen quarries. Um, <clears throat> the Solenhofen limestone has been quarried and used since at least the Roman times. Um, Solenhofen limestone has many uses as we had touched on. And the most important is the most important product of the area. Special guilds were set up uh, to create rules for quarrying the limestone. Everyone in the community had a share in the limestone in the quarry. So uh, that made things very interesting because you had a little section of the quarry that was yours. So they had to make up all sorts of rules as to how this was all going to work. As we talked about, uh, limestones used for tile, decorative sculptures, roof tiles, and lithographic um, um, presses. presses. Um, as a result, the fo fossils were discovered and became very important to the area as well. Uh, the town name of Solnhofen comes from the settlement of an Anglo-Saxon monk named Solus in 750. So that's this here. Uh, the earliest evidence of the utilization of Solenhof and limestone was uh, from this Roman bath uh, that was part of a, a fort uh, near Wiesenberg, uh, Germany. And this is the remains of the Sola Basilica from the 6th to 7th century. These are some pictures of the early quarrying activity. I can assure you it does not look like this now. Uh, this was back in the heydays. Uh, and uh, you can see all the workers here. Um, when, you, when you see this thicker limestone, this would have been the heydays of the lithographic limestone coming out. Um, but you can see there was a lot of workers here. And you can see the types of, of slabs that they were able to pull up. Here you can see a picture of a, a giant fish they had found. Uh, Solnhof and tile has been used, as we mentioned, since Roman times. Many floors and buildings and churches in Europe are made with Solnhof and limestone. So you'll see a lot of, sorry, um, You'll see a lot of floors and churches that have um, the limestone on the bottom uh, or on the walls. On the, on the left-hand side, this is an example of uh, the limestone being carved for a tombstone. This is a modern house in, in the Solenhofen area. And on the roof, uh, much like slate is used, this is uh, Solenhofen tiles that were used for the roof. Um, well, you know, there was a ro very robust market for the tile itself, but the invention of lithographic printing put Solenhof and really on the, on the world map, certain quarries contained the fine grain limestone slabs used for printing. Um, a gentleman named, uh, Alos Senenfelda invented the lithographic printing method in 1798. And this really opened a new, very lucrative market. The limestone at the Solenhofen and Morsheim quarries had the traits of thick plates and consistent fine grains. This homogeneous structure was capable of handling the pressure of the printing presses, which you can see here. And here you can see a, a probably a little bit more modern printing press in, in action. And you can see uh, on the upper right, the, uh, the quarry workers use uh, like a metal grid to 
um, mark out the, the, the plate and then they would work on trimming that plate down to that size because they needed to fit into the printing press. Um, there's some examples of, of the plates uh, on the left here. On the right is a plate that we happen to own. And, um, and, and what you would have is uh, for a printing process, you would have a series of plates if you were gonna do multicolors so that um, certain areas would print different colors. But this is from uh, a, a plate from one of my favorite uh, German beers, Weinstefan. There's really literally hundreds and hundreds of quarries in the Solenhofen area. Germany has similar laws to the U.S. in requiring old quarries to be backfilled when the quarry work is done. While this is true, if you walk through the forest, you would find a lot of very, very old abandoned quarries. The large quarries are mainly worked by immigrants, first the Italians, then the Yugoslavians, and then finally the Turkish worked in the quarries. Here's some pictures of uh, some of the quarries. Uh, like I said, hundreds exist. Uh, Eichstadt's probably one of the more famous uh, ones. Harthof and Heineheim are another quarries. They all look very similar, but um, different quarries tended to have uh, different things that were found there. On, on this page, you can see on the left, Upper left is uh, Langendalfheim, which where they found three of the archaeopteryx in this quarry. It is a, just just a massive quarry. The uh, the the quarry reed uh, is famous for starfish, and then the Pinton quarry uh, on the bottom there uh, has been um, part of a commercial dig. We'll talk about. But you can see these yellow containers here. The, the, the limestone here really isn't good for tile or anything, and it's used mainly for concrete. So that's a, a basically sacrete. That's why it's yellow. Um, and then um, these are uh, uh, three more quarries. The Schamhopton, again, Archaeopteryx was found there. Uh, the Schadeberg is... Um, uh, a quarry that is mainly a hobby quarry, which we'll talk about, and Scherenfeld. Zant is a quarry we've been in, um, another famous quarry, and, as well as Wintersoft. They all tend to start looking alike, but again, the, the what you find in them is, can be quite different. <laughs> so, um, the uh, quarry is, is really mined by workers who basically live in the quarry. The, the slabs are hand mined and tested by the ping of a hammer to see whether the, the slab is uh, good for tile or not. This method of mining has been used throughout the ages. And in some cases, machinery is used to clear off the unwanted material. So you can see down here, they have a, a, a front loader here so they'll go through and strip out a, a section here, quarry it by hand, and then toss the stuff that's not you know, uh, good for tile off to the side. Um, during the season, um, the Turkish workers tend to live in the quarry. So you'll see in the quarries uh, trailers here. And, and the interesting part is, you know, the, the these rough and tough quarry men have lace curtains on their windows <laughs> in their trailers. Um, so the, the slabs that come out of the, the, the hand quarrying look like this up in the upper right. And those are just rough sla uh, slabs that have come out. And then once they're processed and cut into the sizes required for the tile, they'll, st they'll be stacked in another wooden crate. And a lot of this cutting ends up being done in the in these types of, sh of shelters there. Um, this is uh, in in the uh, Solnhofen Museum, and it's a recreation of kind of a, the area where they might be uh, making this tile. This is actually from one of the quarries, and this was a, a gentleman that had worked in the quarry for a long time. You can see the guides they use for the different tile sizes. And here's the clippers he uses to, to, uh, to 
cut those down. And it is quite the skill to be able to do it. And um, he gave me a try for it. And it was, it took a lot to try to, to trim that down. And um, when you look at that guy's hands, he had calluses like you wouldn't believe from doing that for all those years. Um, let me go back here. Um, one of the things that has happened is that more synthetic tile has come on to the market and really dampen the demand for Solnhofen tile. And the result of that is that, you know, in the past you had thousands of workers in the quarry and now you have probably less than 50 workers in the quarry. So this has really had a significant impact on the number of new fossils found. So uh, geologically, uh, Solnhofen is Jurassic. So, and it's late Jurassic, so we're in here. And most of the quarries are Tithonian or Kimmeridgian. There's a little bit of Exfordian, but not very much. So we're mainly in these, in these two areas. Uh, this is a deep time map. I apologize, it's a little fuzzy. I couldn't get a better resolution one. Um, but here you can see the Solnhofen area would have been right in here. So you have this big landmass of Laurasia here, Gondwana down here, China's over here, and you have the Tethys Ocean here. And this is just the beginning of the Atlantic Ocean. So the archipelago of uh, Solnhofen would have been in here. Again, here's the, the kind of the deep time map and you can see, sorry. Uh, my mouse. Um, you can see some of the quarries we we talked about here, Dieting and uh, Langen Alfheim and Solnhofen. So you can see a little bit where these huge coral reefs were, and then the blue would have been the the basins that that these things are uh, were in. The stratigraphy of Solnhofen has been looked at over and over. Um, um, you, you can, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where, um, um, it's being reworked over and over, but, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the different quarries and they've mapped them to different horizons. And they've also, uh, mapped them to the, to the ammonite zones. So, um, you know, the, it, they've done a lot of work on this, but as anything in science, it keeps changing. This chart really shows where the different archaeopteryx were found and what layers, and you can see a lot of them were concentrated in, in, in uh, a certain uh, area. And again, the names of the formations seem like they change constantly, uh, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. This was an interesting quarry that our friend uh, Helmut Tischlinger took us to. And it's it's one of the few quarries in the area that shows almost all of the White Jurassic. And the White Jurassic um, really is all the sort of like the, the what you think of the normal Solenhofen limestones. And what's kind of neat about it is they've, they've really mapped every bit of this quarry face. And you can almost hold the, the picture of the stratigraphy up against the quarry face to see that. So that was, was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> this is a kind of a close up of some quarry walls. This was in the Zant quarry. And you can see how this has been deposited. And in, in, in this particular instance, how almost consistent the, the thickness of these layers were. But the other thing I wanted you to see was notice how these cracks and the these cracks and in, in fractures are all throughout things so this is one of the things that contributes to the fact that a lot of the fossils you find and especially the bigger ones do not come out in one piece they're usually fractured some way or another they also sometimes have these big crevices um in, in um the rock and uh, I know in, in one of the uh, quarries we went to, there were people that were uh, extracting the material out of these crevices because these would have been inlaid with Pleistocene 
material. Now, the other thing about some of the quarries is that, as you can see on the left-hand side, you see the horizontal deposits here, and then it gets all messed up. You see that over here. And there's different schools of thought about what, what happened here. Um, a lot of people historically have think that uh, massive storms have caused that disruption there. But a lot of people now think that maybe this was just simply gravity, that you had all this fine material and as it built up and built up, if there was any slope whatsoever, it might have just slid down and slid over itself. So uh, that's still kind of in, in, in uh, discussion. Um, the Solon, as we mentioned before, the Solon area was an archipelago. The uh, the upper Jurassic was a period of rising and falling sea levels coupled with a climate change from warm and humid to semi-arid. Uh, for many years, the quarries were thought to be a lagoon deposit. Uh, lagoons are basins that are mostly or entirely separated from the open sea by barriers like sand or coral reefs. The lagoons had layers of water and lower layers were anaerobic. Animals falling to the lower layers were not scavenged before they were buried, which gave you all this beautiful preservation. The concept of lag lagoons is contested now, and many researchers now think the quarries were basins. Basins are an indentation bowl like a structure, but mainly underwater, but many parts, but many may have parts sticking out of the water. Basins would be exposed to the open sea, which is the big difference between basins and lagoons. So with changing sea levels, this would impact ba the, the, the basins and, and uh, both basins and lagoons could have anaerobic layers of water. So I think there's a lot more work to be done. Um, the paleobiota is uh, diverse. The Solenhofen area produces fossils from algae to Archaeopteryx. It is a mix of plants, terrestrial, and marine animals. At times, the water would dry up, and this created the salinity and anaerobic conditions. If a basin dried out, insects may land in the sticky carbonate mud and then sub subsequently get buried again. This is another um, picture of, of, of the area. And again, you can see here, the archipelago of, of, um, of the Sonhofen area and the impact of the Tethys Ocean coming in on this. Uh, <clears throat> you know, as, as I uh, previously talked about, the, the fossils found in the quarries near the Sonhofen area attracted a lot of attention. Um, many physicians and nobles were interested in them and accumulated vast collections. Many became scientists who would describe and name the fossils. The heyday was really the 17 to 1800s. Here's some pictures of uh, the you know some of the more famous um, collectors and scientists. And what you'll find is that a lot of of, of these, if you look at some of the uh, fossil species names, the last names here show up quite a bit. So they were very active in the initial description of, of many of the fossils. Now, this, this page has two very famous people on it, the Haberlins. So Carl, the father, and this was his son, Otto, um, were, were uh, physicians. Um, and they were very much Solenhofen collectors. Carl was a doctor in Solenhofen, and he treated local miners, and, and it's kind of hypothesized that he was paid in the form of fossils. In any case, he was local to the area, so had access to the workers. The Haberlins had several collections. One was sold to the Bavarian state in Munich in 1857, Carl sold the London specimen of Archaeopteryx, along with 1,756 other specimens, uh, to the British Museum in 1862 for 700 pounds. Otto Haberlin, his son, continued this, uh, 
and his uh, he he sold specimens to Harvard and Yale in 1890 and 1892. Now you may recognize one of the guys on this page, uh, Aguiz. Uh, it seems like Louis Aguiz was everywhere, and he had his hand in uh, the Songhofen area as well. Um. Um, the Solenhofen area has uh, has had a history of having scientific digs at some of the quarries, um, and um, they tend to operate for many years over the summer, and they're very heavily dependent on funding. the f The finds were curated and prepared at the museums, but as the museums had very little money to pay for preparation preparers were often paid in kind with duplicate specimens. Also, many times the digs were concurrent with private collectors and quarries such as Zetling. So that is why sometimes you will see that people have specimens from these scientific digs. These are some of the digs that uh, have been going on. Um, Brune up there was by the Bavarian State. Uh, one that is active right now is New Splingen by the Stuttgart Museum, and below that, the Wattendorf uh, Quarry by the Bomberg Museum. The diding uh, is, is basically done. We've been in that quarry, and it's pretty much done. Falls Pint was a, a quarry that was very famous for its jellyfish that were found there. That was done by the Solnhofen Museum. And Etling uh, was by the Jura Museum. Uh, the Solnhofen area has a uh, a lot of hobby quarries, and they have one commercial dig that we're aware of. Um, the hobby quarries are open to visitors who who can collect. Um, just generally a fee to collect, and many quarries will reserve the right to keep any significant finds. Some quarries even provide hammers and and um, and chisels. Um, this is one of the quarries. We saw a picture of this earlier, the Schadeberg quarry. Um, it is uh, in near Mulheim, which is not far from Solenhofen. Uh, they have a small shop, shop in there. They have a beer garden. Uh, the quarry is notable for, for its many finds, uh, including Elvis, which was a terracer that we had a paper on this year, which was found just in this area of the quarry. Yeah, terracer. Uh, they also, uh, the owners of this quarry also have their own private quarry that they, they dig in. Uh, there's other uh, hobby quarries, both in, uh, in Solenhof and here, and then there's one in Eichstadt in Blumenberg. And as you can see, um, a lot of the, the, the elementary schools in Germany will bring their kids out to go actually go collecting in the quarries. Um, Schamhopton is actually now a collector's quarry. It's no, there's no fee associated with it, but there is a kind of a uh, uh, a understanding that if you find something is has a value of a certain amount, half of that has to go to the city. <laughs> I don't know how they enforce that, but somehow or another. But Archaeopteryx was found at this quarry as well. The only commercial dig we're aware of is the Pinton Quarry, and um, that dig has been active for over 20 years. Uh, it's a particularly rich area of the quarry that they're digging in, and um, the dig's financed by a man named Raymond Elbersdorfer, and over the years, he's found many extraordinary specimens here. Um, he has three people that work from the spring to the fall, and... Um, even so, it, you know, it's an area where the fossils are, are still very rare. <laughs> Sorry. This again is the Pine Quarry. We happen to be, have the opportunity to go there. And here's Renee where she actually found a, 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 a Thrissops fish that day, although that required quite a bit of prep. Sorry. Um, museums, there are a lot of museums in the Solenhofen area. 
uh, you know, with this long history of fossils and things, you can imagine that this was just right for museums. So here's a list of, of uh, different museums. Some of them are close. Obviously, Berlin and Stuttgart aren't right in that area, but there's there's quite a few there. Uh, this is the Bomberg Museum and some of the specimens that are found there. The Berlin Museum, which is uh, a, a beautiful museum. And of course, they had the Berlin archaeobjects there. This is the Dino Park in Deckendorf. And, uh, and they generally have rotating uh, ex exhibitions there and a whole dinosaur experience. Uh, but they, they generally have um, some Solnhofen material there. Most of what's in there is from uh, Pynton because uh, Raymond's involved with this. Um, this is the Eura Museum in Eichstadt. And this is the uh, some of the collection area, which interestingly enough, as I mentioned, this collection uh, area is in the basement of the seminary. Bavarian State Museum in Munich it's not really a, a museum, although you can see things. I was lucky enough here. This is the Munich archaeopteryx specimen. I was able to see that. And of course, because it, it, it's been around so long, a lot of holotypes of uh, things that were described by all those uh, old scientists uh, reside here. This is the Berger Museum near Eichstadt. He, he is a quarry owner that was very interested in fossils, so he has his own little museum. And, of course, the Sonhofen Museum is a, a must-see as well. Uh, the biota. We'll finally look at a few specimens. <clears throat> the collection cons consists of over 2,200 specimens. Um, you know, we talked before how many vertebrates and things we have, so I won't spend time on that. Here's some uh, examples of the things we have. Um, on the left is an undescribed plant, which we're actually hoping the Field Museum is going to do some work on so all these undescribed plants that we have. Uh, Zemites, it's a cycad, it's not a fern um, that uh, was uh, you know, from the area. But here we go from algae on. So we have algae, we have some soft sponges, codites. We have jellyfish. Um, we have octocoral, which uh, you can sort of see the outline of it. And this was a like a, a a hard coral that would be like on a stalk that would kind of float in the ocean and uh, feed that way. Worms, brachiopods, bivalves, gastropods, ammonites. Here's a nautilus for. Um, John, squids, insects, dragonflies with incredible preservation, grasshoppers. This is a, a wasp-like creature, which is the counterpart to the holotype. Remember, that a lot of times when you split these fossils, you may have two sides to it, just like you have a Maison Creek concretion. Um, crabs. Um, this is an interesting, very much rarer than Archaeopteryx. This, uh, these are not claws or anything, but these are these weird antenna that had this Cancrinos crab had. Cyclerian, another crab. Shrimps. Horseshoe crabs. Crinoids and starfish. Sea urchins, just beautifully preserved. Uh, brittle stars. A lot of uh, rock shows you'll find brittle stars from Solenhofen for sale. This is a uh, acorn worm, um, a hemichordate. Um, this is, again, the counterpart to the holotype. Um, ratfish, chimera. Uh, we found uh, individual shark's teeth and then holomorphic entire sharks and um, small sharks, angel-type sharks. And it is, as you can tell, this one came from my son, sharks not from Solenhofen. A <laughs> um, lot of different types of moonfish. You know, again, remember there was reefs around there. 
Uh, so we have Gerodus up in the upper right. Uh, again, all sorts of moonfish. Uh, this is Lepidotes, um, huge scales on these. Um, this is um, uh, th uh, Thrissops, uh, salmon-like fish from Etlene. And some of these Etlene fish almost preserve the color of the fish in them. And they're amazing. Um, coelacanths. By the way, all these are in the collection. Uh, turtles, juvenile turtles, lizards, pterosaurs. The pterosaur on the left there is called darkwing. That is not in the collection, but it's one where they almost feel like the, the preservation of the circulatory system in the wings was preserved. The skull on the, the right uh, was a filter feeder. As you can tell, those are teeth sticking out of the, uh, the, the, if you will, the bill of it. Crocodiles, the one on the left is, is not ours, but the one on the right is. Ichthyosaurs. And then these are a little, some of the behaviors you sometimes see in Solenhofen. Because of the excellent preservations, you can see this horseshoe crab and you can see where it came down and started to walk along here. So now there's a lot of discussion about whether, oh, is this the death tracks to where it died? Was it molting? Did it just walk across where the, when the, the basin dried out? There's a lot of discussion about what's really going on here. This is a, um, a long arm crab. And this is the the remnants of a molting. So it flopped down there on the on the bottom, and it molted, and then swam away. So this is just the molting skin uh, of the of the lobster. Now the the collector scene in um, in in the Solenhofen area is pretty robust. Um, I would say it's very similar to the Maison Creek collector scene, probably in the 60s and 70s. Um, and hopefully now with a renaissance of it all coming uh, around again. Um, this is um, a, a good friend of ours, Dr. Hamlet Tischlinger and uh, Dr. Martin Gorlick, who uh, are uh, people we work with uh, continuously. There's other collectors we call Roger Fratigiani, the shrimp man. Um, he spends four weeks a year of his vacation in the quarries collecting. He, he collects primarily shrimp and he's had several species named after him. And as a result of that, he decided to tattoo on his calf, one of his uh, shrimps that were named after him. <clears throat> These are other collectors. Um, Stefan Schaefer, you can see he's holding uh, Darkwing and uh, Dr. Martin Garlic. And um, this is Steph uh, Stefan Seltzer, one of the best preppers of German material in the world. And our friend Udo Resch down here. And of course, uh, you know, we collect as well. <laughs> Um, preparation. Um, uh, sawn off on fossils are not easy to prepare. The limestone can be very hard or very soft. Specimens are often found fractured in many pieces. Uh, while the stone looks like Green River Matrix, it is very different, requiring special tools. Many times fossils are inlaid in another more aesthetic limestone slab. In some cases, parts may be missing and be reconstructed. Um, Here's an example of a very difficult preparation and even a difficult extraction. We happened to be in the area when they found this croc, uh, crocodile. And most of it, you can see here's a picture of Rene with it. Most of it is in one of these crevices and was inlaid with, with just mud and things in between this. So part of it's in the limestone, part of it's not. And so they ended up having to try to pull this out. And what they ended up doing is putting resin over it so they could ext extract it. And here's a picture of it once they got into the workshop. Now, a, a simpler picture is here's a picture of an unprepped fish. And you can see it's, you know, 
to a certain extent, it looks like Green River where you'd have to prep all this out, which is what you have to do, but it's just very hard material. Um, so this is a preparation lab. This is uh, our our uh, our prepper here. And, and the point of this is working under a microscope. It's important that you work on this under a microscope and using a UV light so that you don't destroy any um, soft tissue. <clears throat> Ultraviolet light in Solenhofen fossils. So um, the ultraviolet light is a useful tool when dealing with many fossils and especially Solenhofen fossils. It is used as a tool to detect soft tissue preservation, hopefully preserve it as it might be lost in preparation. It's also a powerful tool to help detect restoration that may not may have been done on a fossil. But it is a tool that requires uh, use of safety procedures. And you really need an adequate knowledge of the anatomy of the fossil and the microscope and a, and a microscope and magnification. What is UV? Well, there's A, B, and C. And here you can see the it's measured in uh, nanometers or NM, and you can see the different wavelengths. Um, and again, um, you need to be very careful when you're using UV and use safety glasses and skin protection. This was a poster that Renee put together for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, and it, it really described how we uh, use UV light uh, in, in the foundation and kind of our setup for taking pictures. This is our kind of our lab for UV photography. And, um, and we use, um, <clears throat> we have a, a camera stand as you can see, and then we have a 95 watt UV light, which has both A, B and C to photograph the specimens. Uh, and each wavelength can produce different results. And the orange filter it use helps to take the purple tint out, and obviously a dark room would it helps reduce the reflection of the of the UV. This is an example. Uh, or actually, Renee's used this a couple times in different posters and talks um, of of what UV can do for you. You can see on this side, this is a a shrimp that was came right out of the quarry. But you, you can sort of see the body here, but you don't really see much. But look what happens when you put it under UV. You can see all the antenna. There was no prep done. That's just the way it is under UV. This is another example. This is a pterosaur foot. Um, and, you know, it's a beautiful specimen uh, uh, in, in daylight. And then when you look under... UV, what do you see? You see the soft tissue between the toes. And this has, you know, has helped confirm the fact that the pterosaurs had webbed feet. This is another example of a shark. This is a, uh, a juvenile shark. And under daylight, this looks great, but looks what pops out when you look under UV. These are the gill rakers of the shark that have been preserved. This is a uh, example of the inlay and some restoration. Um, this is a be beautiful cyclarian uh, lobster, and it's on this beautiful slab with the dendrites around it. it. It's just a gorgeous piece. But when you look at it under UV, you see some things. You notice that the tops of the claws don't show up. The tail's got a different color to it. And you see blue all the way around it. Well, the blue all the way around it is highly indicative of it being inlaid. So this had been cut out of another piece and then inlaid into that beautiful slab. And here you can see that this looks kind of suspicious. Now, all UV tells you is that you better go look at this under magnification to see if, you, if that's been restored or if there's some other reason it doesn't show like the rest of it. We're getting to the end. Um, yeah, the Lauer Foundation uh, makes its collection available to researchers. Um, 
we actually go a step further and we actively seek out researchers to work on important specimens. Uh, we work with various institutions on exhibitions and the exhibitions may be simply by loaning specimens to be included in an exhibit or an entire exhibit. One of our, our first entire exhibits was with the Burpee Museum uh, and we called it a snapshot in time. We worked with Scott Williams and Josh Matthews to put that together. And we were lucky enough to have Hans Dieter Seuss from the Smithsonian come out and give the opening, opening day lecture on that. It was very nice of him. Um, here's an example we uh, do with uh, just loaning some uh, things. It, if you've been to the Fume Museum lately, you can see that those two pterosaurs in the background are from the foundation and have been on the long-term loan with them. Um, the Ura Museum had a special exhibition and they were trying to highlight the various types of collectors. And so we were kind of in between a private collector and a museum. And so they were interested in, in, in us. And so we had um, this beautiful lizard uh, on display there. And, and the interesting thing is they had us want, they wanted us to do a video to explain the foundation and stuff. And Renee and I worked on that for a long time and um, had, had, had a very difficult time. And our oldest son helped edit it. And he said, the only thing stiffer in that, in the, uh, in that movie uh, was, the, was than the rocks was us. So uh, he, he goes, I don't think we're going to show you very much. We'll show something else on top of it. Just save your voice. Um, research papers. This was uh, Elvis. This was our most recent research paper. This is a, a holotype. This is Dave Hone from the UK working on it. And this was when Elvis was just out of the quarry. And um, and it's named Elvis because of this this. Um, crested Scott. This is the artist's recreation from one of the authors, uh, Freddie Spindler, put that together. Uh, this again was when it came out of the quarry. This is Oliver Rahut from the um, Munich Museum. But Rene was a co-author on this, this paper, and it is a holotype that we hold in the collection. There's another paper on a Hybotus that we worked with Chris Duffin on. This is another holotype. This is a chimera twin egg case from Germany. Again, Chris Duffin uh, described that. And uh, JP Brown from the Field Museum did the photogrammetry for us on that. This was one of the first papers that was done. Rene was the co-author on this with, um, and this is a, a plegic crocodilomorph. Um, and this was a picture with three of the Four authors, unfortunately, the fourth author, uh, author had passed away. And then we have a, a series of uh, posters that we've done uh, for the uh, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology on different specimens or outreach uh, programs on UV, all sorts of things. And those are our references. So I am done. I'm open for questions. And maybe I stop sharing and then we can see everybody. How come some of the museums are closed? Um, one, one of them, uh, the, the museum, you know, a lot of these museums are private museums. And I think it all depends on whether they have funding or they don't have funding. And the Maxburg collection went to one that was in another town and when that closed up, um, then uh, somehow or another, that Maxburg archaeopteryx disappeared. There's a lot I'll of go open. I mean, Sorry, there's a lot. There's a a lot of people that think they know where it is, but it's a very kind of uh, secretive thing. So I like we open some of it. Uh, well, no, that that particular museum's closed uh, permanently, but the the rest of the museums uh, are are open. You know, the bigger ones like Berlin and Stuttgart are going to be open. Um, 
The Solenhofen one and the Eura, they tend to close over the winter because they just don't have tourists. So they they probably they close down happen. January, February, probably open in and March. You, and most of and the you said that BCM is cold permanently. What, what will become of the fossils? Well, that's that's the question. And of course, that's why a lot of scientists have problems with with private collectors and private uh, institutions. And that's kind of the difference we've done is that we've kind of established a, a succession plan and things to make sure that the specimens will be available in perpetuity for for research. And that's so. And that's one of the reasons we can hold holotypes and things like that. We've met those requirements. I hope the fossil would protect that soon. We don't want to get damaged. They're a fine specimen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah, Bruce, I had a question. Um, you mentioned early on uh, something about the guilds, and I wondered yeah. if that meant uh, people own, like, individually or families own sections of Cori. Yes. Did they work cooperatively when it came to moving the commercial material? Um, yes. And that was the purpose of these guilds. I mean, you know, the, the thing about, you know, like in, what, in the village, if there was a Cori in the village, everybody in the village owned a portion of that. Mm -hmm. And so you have these people that maybe were farmers and did other things, but then would go and Cori. And, you know, if you had, you know, just this, you know, 20 foot wide section, then how did this work, you know, and so that they, they had, you know, a huge rule book of this is how it works. And then I think then it morphed into uh, more of a co-op where, you know, they, everybody just worked the area and maybe split it up or something, you know. And, I, and to that point, I was going to ask, is there any documentation that if a very special fossil was found, was the proceeds shared in that case, since it was kind of cooperative mining? Uh, or do you know if they were, if, if things were sold individually, it's like finders keepers? I think it was finders keepers. I mean, even today, I mean, you know, the, I, I, I would say 99% of the fossils that come out of the Sonhofen quarries today and probably the last 200 years were taken out by the workers. And the, the, the feeling was, you know, the, the quarry owners made their money and they didn't pay the workers very much. And the side part of it was they got to keep the fossils. That was all in fine and good when it was a, an egg or shrimp or something like that. But when it came to an archaeopteryx, that became a whole nother deal. So that, you know, there, you know, even to today, I mean, the Turkish workers, they'll come out, they'll have, they'll find something and, and uh, the dealers there have to go down there at night and go take a look at it and decide. And, and the bad thing about it is that um, if you, if you're a dealer and, you know, a 90, you know, most of this is not collected by individuals, you'll find some stuff, but because they're so far between, it's it's you know you can go like uh, like Roger who goes there for for four weeks a year and he may find a couple of shrimp or something but that's it he doesn't find a lot oh. and it's not abundant like it is for Green River or some of these other places right. so uh, so a lot of this just it comes out you know on on the side and the and the dealers have to go and basically buy everything or they don't get called anymore. So they need to have a, a network, a network to dispose of uh, the more commercial stuff, and that's what you're going to see at the rock shows, right? It, is that kind of stuff, right? Uh, the other it, thing too is you've got a number of people that you know maybe had a collection, and they're getting old up in years, and you find that their their family doesn't want it. They don't, you know, the kids don't want it at, at this point. Um, <laughs> You know, if, if you're lucky, you know, you, if they've documented it properly, maybe it finds its way to a museum. If not, um, they just want it disposed of. If, they, if it's of any value at all, uh, then maybe it comes up on a secondary market. And um, I think that's happening maybe more often now. We're certainly not finding a lot of material in the quarries anymore because there's so few people working in the quarries. Uh, amateurs can collect 
and they can sell if, if sell it if they want, um, given given the approval of the quarry. But uh, but I think you've got a, a secondary market that's coming up with uh, with material yeah. that was in in somebody's collection that's that's now coming back out because nobody in the family wants it. Well, remember. Yeah. Remember too, we you used to have thousands of workers, and now you have twenty workers. And if you know the the general rule is a worker in the quarry may once a year find a special fossil, mm -hmm. once a year. Wow. Yeah. So you know, um, so what what you find now is like Renee said is a lot of these collectors have been collecting for fifty years. And they you know, they upgrade, they they get better stuff. Or in, in the case, part of our collection came from one individual, a guy that was he 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 basically was like a dealer. He would go down and and had the connections to to get material. He would keep the very best for himself and then had channels to get rid of the rest. And he did this for you know 30 years. And um he he had amassed this huge collection. Well, he he died of a heart attack at fifty two or something, and uh, you know none of the family was interested, but they realized that it was valuable, and so then there was a uh, you know a, a matter of what you know what are you going to do with it? He wanted to to, to go right. to a museum, but the ex wife and the daughter weren't so keen on that because they knew it was worth some money. And uh, and so, you know, one of the dealers there uh, found the best solution he could, tried to keep it together. Well, it was a very, very big collection. So half of it came to us and half of it went to the guy who owns the Thermopolis Archaeopteryx. So it's in two spots. And then the other part of it is that collection was um, that that deal was done with the blessing of Stuttgart in Munich. So Stuttgart got to look through that museum, got to look through the things and they took the dragonflies that they needed for their collection out of that before it would ever come anywhere else. So yeah, when we, when we, ones. when we're doing these types of acquisitions, they're done under the auspices of maybe not officially, but under the auspices of the museums in Germany. Plus, plus then they know where it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And like you said, the Lauer Foundation makes available your collection to research, et right. cetera. So it's very, it's accessible. One one last observation slash question. You know, we celebrate um, uh, uh, Mary Anning of Lyme Regis, England today, but in her day, mm -hmm. it was a lot of the gentlemen scientists, right? Who were, who were priests and doctors, et cetera, um, who would make inexpensive acquisitions and then donate them to the British Museum or Paleontological Society, et cetera. And I'm wondering if some of these early scientists whom you said uh, a lot of the specimens were were named after, if, if it was a similar thing, they're essentially acquiring or procuring the fossils from the workers and then donating them under their name or having them research. I mean, were they were they scientists as in like were they writing the papers themselves or were they sort of just transacting no, the fossils I, in that case? I think, I think the early on ones were, uh, well, first of all, they were fascinated by them. And I think given that they were, you know, professionals being physicians or pharmacists or something like that and had sort of a scientific background, they were interested in these in the first place. And I think a lot of them went from, what what you might call amateur scientists to you know pro professional and maybe not in degree but then would describe things now did they always describe them correctly no but but uh that's science but that science you know, evolves right. yeah learn so. from each 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 you know each thing um and, and that's what you know that's what's recorded until you know more but i think uh collectors like the haberlins have been kind of character, characterizes more <clears throat> uh while they were collectors and stuff they were clearly out to make money and so <laughs> while you know 700 pounds doesn't sound like much for that collection at that time it was a lot of money so uh but you know on the flip side it ended ended up in a museum same with the the sale to, they did one to munich and then they sold yale and harvard so yeah 
So that's why, you know, sometimes when you, you the museums, uh, people get a little up in their arms about, you know, oh, you shouldn't be buying fossils and doing things. I'm like, museums have done that for hundreds of years. <laughs> Yeah. Bruce, how deep is the fossil layer go? Uh well, when you go in the quarries, um, you know, they it's probably two, three hundred feet at least of, of material. Um, and of course, you know, you have all the different layers there. So there's going to be some that have more fossils than others. But the uh like the Berger quarry, we've been in that and the bottom and as we as we went down, remember I talked about the white Jurassic, and then of course the black Jurassic is more what you see in the UK, and but as you go down in these quarries, um, you get some darker, almost grayish layers, and the preservation, while it's really good, is almost more organic. You see almost like a almost carbon a, carbon type imprint of of some of the things. So. It, it it was funny when we went in the in the the quarry we're we're sort of in there and and um berger himself um is very picky about who's in his quarry so his son is like the foreman he comes down in a pickup truck and so we're down there and, and the two of the turkish workers knew one of the guys we were with and we explained to the berger's son that we're we were tourists in 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 all we wanted to do is see where they find the fossils and stuff like that and and the, so berger's son goes he goes well yeah you can look all you want here he goes and this was towards the bottom of the quarry he goes you know when these things die they all floated to the top so you're never going to find anything at the bottom of the quarry they're all at the top of the quarry and we go oh thank you very much for that wise information you're telling us we'll we'll just continue to look here uh and then That's of right. course of course the 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 turkish guys didn't hear that we were tourists they heard that we were terrorists and so <laughs> so that you know that so they've always joked about the you know the well, two the ter terrorists that were yeah, that came around were in the quarry so well, and they're always a little intrigued, you know, having a girl in there. Um, and that was actually the the uh, Euro Museum um, had closed for some time. And then they, when they reopened, they named a new director. And that director mm -hmm. wanted to bring people back into the fold. Um, she wanted to show that uh, that fossils are meant to be admired and appreciated by everybody of all walks of life, of all ages. And uh, so she opened an exhibit that was showing people from childhood all the way up through professionals and museum staff all working in different capacities that were enjoying enjoying fossil collecting, preparing, curating, you know, whatever your, whatever the, the niche was. Um, she said, I'd, I'd like to include you in the poster. And, it, and they included me in it because they were intrigued with it. There was a, a woman working in the quarries um, and uh, and then invited us to then exhibit in the in that exhibition. So yeah. we were very, very honored, very touched by that. And they've been incredibly gracious and kind to us. And um, uh, so we we like to keep those connections open there. Um, I think we all learn a lot more by having um, many eyes on these things to to learn and appreciate um, from one to the other. Yeah. I've been thinking, mm -hmm. you said that archaeologist, this, that archaeologist part was missing, right? Disappear? What, yep. what if it was the stolen? Uh, well, stolen? I, 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 would, I would argue it was stolen. <laughs> It's. I it's, think in the same way, maybe we've been stolen. I know it missed you in your center, so they haven't sipped the one with the missing pain that was stolen. They don't know what happened to them. Still mystery. Yeah. Well, maybe they've you been know, probably to you know, some you know. black market. Oh, yeah. Some well, hair. see, the problem with Archaeopteryx on the black market, everybody would know exactly what this thing is. And so, I mean, the, you know, not you're not going to you're not going to be able to sell it. The other thing is uh, in Germany, Archaeopteryx is a, a cultural heritage item. So an Archaeopteryx that's found in Germany has to stay in Germany. Doesn't have to be in a museum, but it has to stay in Germany. And uh, there's certain exceptions, like for instance, the one in Thermopolis, uh, the, the guy who owns it is a, a uh, native German, so he's German, 
but somehow or another he had he had gotten it out and and so uh you know the law came into effect i don't know maybe what year 15 20 years ago so you know it's the same thing if you could prove it was found you know was not in germany 20 years ago that would be okay but but in any case um so if you're trying to sell an archaeopteryx in germany um there's not really uh, all the museums that want <clears throat> one have one and um and private collectors there's not very many that have enough money that they could afford one so if you have it in my old days, yeah, it's just, called a very illiquid asset because what are you going to do with it? Well, I was just thinking because I thought maybe it was stolen. Maybe it's yeah. thinking it was stolen. Well, it, it is. It's going to show up one of these days mm -hmm. and there'll be some story around it and it'll end up back somewhere. But um, yeah. but don't forget, that specimen's already been studied to the nth degree. It's just the fact that where is it it's, right it's, now? It's missing. Yeah, but I, I will t I will say, though, um, you know, that happens far more often and we run into this all the time and I'm not going to point any fingers because it's literally occurred in every institution we've we've been in um, the number of times that something is missing um, and it, it turns out it was just misfiled. It was put in the wrong drawer. Um, and um, and, you know, this is one of those things that I'm really happy about uh, people going in and doing dig uh, digitization because it provides them with the opportunity to go through all the collections update the cards, uh, update the, you know, all the data and, and, you know, the names and everything, get, make sure that it's all accurate in their, uh, in their system and get images of it. Um, and so that allows it to be shared more widely and more, more freely between uh, different researchers. Uh, but it also provides them with that opportunity to find where something's maybe been misfiled in just the wrong drawer. And I, I, I think that happens a lot and it's, it's an easy mistake to make. And, um, I think that, you know, so if we go through the, through more institutions or doing more of that process, I think we'll, we'll probably find more material that's actually still in the building somewhere. Yeah. Could, they, uh, could agree with I, you more. Are there any other animals besides Archaeopteryx that are restricted to come out of uh, Germany? Uh, no, that's the prime one. Um, I think if, if we have anything uh, that was, you know, highly unusual it would have to go through um munich oliver rahu in terms to be, in order for it to be exported mm -hmm. i mean on, on the flip side when things come into the u.s when we get a crate in from from germany uh if if our border has any questions the person they go ask is hans dieter seuss so that that that's helpful to us. Uh, to checks and balances. Yeah. So I mean, uh, but Biarchaeopteryx is the is the the prime thing that they're they're concerned about. But I, I think that we're we're putting on way too much focus on one thing. This is about many things, and it's it's at an incredibly rich biodiverse uh, locality, and and it's got incredible preservation of things that shouldn't preserve, like jellyfish, um, and all these other yeah. soft bodied creatures, and. And that to me is far more fascinating. Um, we get asked all the time, uh, you know, what's your favorite? And it, that's a really hard call because we have a lot of favorites. Um, so it kind of changes from week to week, depending on what I'm working on at the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got, a, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on pterosaurs lately, but um, uh, actually one of the things that intrigues me the most are the dragonflies, because I just, I'm absolutely blown away that something as fine as a dragonfly wing could ever possibly preserve and show all that venation. Um, so I, I really want to have, you know, let's, let's have a cheer for the, for the, the invertebrates because I don't think they get their fair due. Yeah. <laughs> one of the, one of the more interesting things that occur in Solenhofen, uh, more than probably other places are, uh, Aptikai, uh, the, uh, yeah. like jaws and, uh, what some think, uh, double as, as the, uh, percolum yeah. of, the, uh, of the ammonite. And, uh, uh, I've got, I've, I've purchased several different types including uh, a small one uh, this, uh, of the ammonite itself, and it's actually attached with the jaws. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not that common to uh, to find. No. Um, and uh, uh, the Solenhofen ones are quite large and very well preserved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
they they really are and you know we actually have a couple of ammonites that oddly enough have preserved almost that iridescent uh outer you know shell to it and um and and for the preservation in in Solnhofen, that's just crazy that that you you get that but we actually have two specimens that have it it's not like you see you know in 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 a lot of south dakota ones and all that right but, but it's there it's it's more along the lines of like the mother pearl where you get that yeah. sheen on yeah. the outside it's really interesting but we, um yeah we have we have a few interesting things coming along on on, on the ammonite uh, <laughs> side so um What's, what's interesting is the you know we, we you know we mentioned the the python quarry um as, as we go through all these different quarries um they're very very different from one another the colors change the texture of the stone changes the amount of dendritic material uh patterns that are on the stone changes uh and it changes you know uh across the the, the span of the quarry but also in layers up and down the quarry uh changes dramatically um and then you get to the python quarry and uh, it's got a very, very different texture, very chalky. And it's used for Sacrete Concrete Company, um, and uh, and they they've been finding just incredible sea urchins there. Um, some of them that we saw um, at, at an exhibit they had it was a special exhibit, a limited time exhibit in Deckendorf, um, and and they had these incredible sea urchins that were about the size of dinner plates. Yeah, uh, it was just spectacular. Well, yeah, with spines like you know like this, just incredible. Uh... And and so you you know so here you got a location with all sorts of urchins but all sorts of pterosaurs and things too. It's just so Renee, you you keep you've mentioned both of you have mentioned a different in the species from one quarry to the other. What's the theory behind why there is such a diversity and and separation between the you know the specimens at the quarries? I think a lot of it has to do, if you remember those deep time maps, mm -hmm. I think it has to do with how close you are to terrestrial land mm -hmm. and also how close you are to the open ocean. <laughs> and, you know, in general, in general, you don't find mm -hmm. big, big things in these in these deposits mm -hmm. because um, shallow marine basins. Yeah, because I, I think a lot of the bigger things would have had the ability to get out of a basin or something and not get trapped in it. And um, either by a storm or maybe just the change in the climate or whatever. Um, and so uh, it's interesting that um, when you go from the east to the west, so you get to Eichstadt in, in the Solnhofen areas, you tend to get way more shrimps and crabs and and insects and things like that uh and and then obviously you know in in uh the Solnhofen area you've got three archaeopteryx found there so you had to have been fairly close to to uh a, a bigger land mass because archaeopteryx was not a pterosaur it didn't fly around like you know like a pterosaur would so um so, it, you know, uh, so it's interesting. And like I said, you know, when I was talking about the quarries, there was some like uh, there was a quarry called Reed and it's just known for starfish. So 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 whatever the environment was there was just conducive for starfish. So you had those there. And um, but it's just in the same token as we have within Maison Creek, um, you know, you have certain certain areas, certain pockets where you tend to find certain types of creatures and um um, you know, you don't tend to find big sharks or things, but you do find that maybe it was, you know, you, you find the Bandringas, you find, you know, you find shark egg cases was it, was it a nursery area because it was a, a shallow area. You know, these are questions that we will continue to ask. Yeah. Uh, I have can give me just one moment. I'm getting a little bit short on memory. We've got two recordings that are out in the cloud, so I'm going to go and stop recording at this point. But that doesn't mean that we're stopping questions. Okay. Be I, I know before you ask your question, I know Alan has been waiting a long time, and he <laughs> keeps 